am Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation, and I'm here today uh, with a special Manhattan Project veteran. And my first question is for you to say your name and spell it. Fred, F-R-E-D, Vasco, V as in Victor, A-S-L-O-W. Great. Okay. All right, we're going to start. Uh, next question is, tell us, when is your birthday? November 17th, 1919. And uh, where were you born? Chicago. Okay, why don't you take the story from here? Tell us a little bit about your childhood and education. Well, well, I grew up in Chicago, nothing much, really much to say. My father was a photographer, and at first we lived in the back of the studio. Later on, we moved to the south side of Chicago, and we had a house, a two-story, the studio below, and uh, we lived above. And it really wasn't an awful lot of interest in my childhood, quite an ordinary childhood. And um, I went to Marquette Grammar School and Harper High School, and then I went to City Junior College and then the University of Chicago. And I started graduate school, and then the war came along, and uh, uh, my boss went off to work on the Manhattan Project, and I was still doing graduate work. And then I got on a project, the University of Chicago, a project that was supposed to make a volatile compound of uranium, which eventually we did, a volatile compound of uranium, which suggested that if we wanted a volatile compound of uranium, means we were out to make a bomb. Anyway, this we got this volatile compound of uranium, which decomposed if you look at it. It wasn't a practical thing, so they settled down and got this uh, material, UF6, which is used now and or has been used at Y12 and K25, or rather just K25, not Y12, to separate the U-235 from the rest of the uranium. So anyway, this project ended, and then I went out to Ames, Iowa, where there was another part of the Manhattan Project. I don't know if it was called the Manhattan Project. Anyway, that was under uh, Dr. Frank Spedding, and uh, Dr. Frank Spedding was an expert in uh, rare earth chemistry, and uh, the, the supposition was that plutonium would have a chemistry similar to rare earth chemistry, which it did not. And anyway, went on in this project, and one of the interesting things about the people at, at, at Ames is that they developed a very nice method for making very pure uranium billets, which they did. Anyway, I wasn't part of that, but at first I just was analyzing uranium, just looked just doing an analysis of the, of the pure uranium they were make. Later on, I got to work on uh, the chemistry of plutonium, uh, tracer amounts of plutonium. They would be radiate something in a, Van de Gra in a, in a cyclotron somewhere, and we get these samples of what I think it was probably uranium with tracer amounts of plutonium. We worked on that for a while, and. Um, Seen nothing very much happened really. Uh, the process we were working on didn't turn out too well. We were hoping that by um, that um, uranium chemistry would be plutonium chemistry would have a volatile fluoride compound. So we we're making these fluoride compounds, and I suppose the fluoride the, we had this, these. Uh, plutonium tracer all over the room, but it didn't, it didn't follow what we're supposed to do. So anyway, after about 1945, this project at Ames was slowing down, and uh, I got the opportunity to go to uh, Los Alamos. They needed somebody with, I guess, my experience, and I got to go to Los Alamos, drove off from Ames, Iowa, to um, through it out, and out into this Wild West. I was grew up in Chicago, and seeing the Wild West was really quite, quite an exciting thrill. Anyway, I, the last day of the trip, I had to cross about two or three mountain ranges, and finally ended up in Santa Fe at P.O. Box 1663 in Santa Fe, where I got directions to go to Los Alamos. Started off for Los Alamos and 
came to this uh, road which snaked up the mountainside, vertical fall at one side, narrow winding road, vertical on the other side. And by the time I got to the top, I blistered my hands, having dropped, um, having um, driven through two mount three mountain ranges that day, and have never experienced mountains before in my life. Anyway, I got to Los Alamos, got a nice dorm room, very pleasant dorm room, and then went went reported to work the next day. Was given uh, two reports to read, Los Alamos one and Los Alamos two. The first said we were here to make a bomb, which is I knew already, and the second one gave about a half a dozen ways of making a, 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 an atomic bomb. So anyway, I started off at my desk, and there at my desk I had little bottles. One was labeled little metal shavings, looked maybe like lead or zinc or any other metal, little shavings. One was labeled combat unit number two and number labeled combat unit number three. Well, about a week later, um, every, I had a white badge, and everybody who had a degree of some sort of some scientific got a white badge. <coughs> excuse, excuse, excuse me which meant uh, that you were just entitled to all the information that was available. And everybody at Los Alamos knew that the bomb test was to be down at, at near Alamogordo, a couple of miles south in a couple of days. Well, having driven through um, from Ames, I had gas coupons, and if you, re you don't remember, <coughs> um, gas was rationed there. And in order to drive, you had a gas, gas coupon. And I had these extra gas coupons, and some people, Los Alamos, wanted to go down there, but they lacked gas coupons. So I got to go along to, uh, to down there. Well, anyway, we camped out overnight. I sang somewhere near uh, Albuquerque, and next morning, uh, these people are with me, more or less, to, um, to uh, where to go. So we started south and drove along the Rio Grande, crossed a bridge over into um, this desert area. Uh, on the maps, it's listed Hornada del Muerto, Journey of Death, very appropriate. And uh, we found a place, Little Ridge, uh, uh, which overlooked toward the east. And um, as far as I remember, I was looking at Google the other day and was sort of identified where we were, perhaps 20 or 25 miles east of the site. We were, we were not there officially. We were, unofficially, but, but nobody was going to stop us and so on. So anyway, we again, we camped out overnight, and the next morning was cold and rainy, and the, the conditions didn't seem very good to, um, to uh, set the bomb off. Uh, I, um, anyway, we were getting kind of discouraged, but then off in the east we saw this red or a green rocket go off in the sky. A couple of minutes later, we saw this red rocket go off into the sky. And then a little bit later, we saw the starting this red glow in the east. It seemed like sort of a dome growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, this dome ever growing larger and larger. Finally, it stopped. We ran for cover, dived behind some rocks. We were on sort of a mountain there. And the uh, Thunderclap came. It wasn't particularly impressive, but 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 there was a thunderclap came. Uh, we saw this cloud coming toward us, and we, as I say, got the hell out of there as fast as we could, back to our cars. Even though we couldn't see, we somehow stumbled back to our cars, to our car, and then headed back and stopped in Albuquerque. Stopped at the local um, Gafanda Inn and. We're toasting our victory over this thing, this great happiness. Anyway, probably scared the hell out of the um, out of the security men. Here we were toasting ourselves, and got back to Los Alamos. There was a headline in the Albuquerque newspaper about this ammunition dump that had exploded in New Mexico, contained pyrotechnics, poison gas, got high explosive, all kinds of strange things. Anyway, um, also I should say that um, the Army had, had scattered trucks, cars, just in case this cloud drifted over it and inhabited places, they were ready to evacuate. So anyway, back to my desk, and about a week later, I was working at my desk, these little tubes of plutonium, 
at the announcement came over a PA system. Our first combat unit has been successfully dropped over Japan. And we cheered. Anyway. And so anyway, um, that was about it. Um, a few days later, the um, people at Los Alamos began to think about the consequences and formed what I think was called the Los, Los Alamos Association of Scientists to try to make sure that this bomb was not going to be used again, but that atomic energy was going to be used for peaceful and useful purposes. Which is So this was formed. And um, anyway, um, I'd been working on plutonium, and then a couple of days later, the war ended. And I want to give my take on this. It's been very controversial. Should we have dropped the bomb? Was this a horrible thing to do? Yes, it was a horrible thing to do. But this was a time of horrors. There was the, the firebombing of, of Tokyo, which killed out those people. There was the horrors of Europe, of the Nazis. There was the horrors of the Japanese in, in Nanking. Any number of horrors. So this was another one of these horrors. And to me, this bomb ended the horrors. We don't know. Well, history won't tell us what might have happened. All we know is that this bomb was dropped a few later, a few days later, the war ended. And I should also emphasize that it wasn't the horror of dropping the bomb, it was the fact, the sheer shock of seeing two cities destroyed in an instant. This is a shock. This is not horror that bothers them. It's seeing their land destroyed. So anyway, uh, back to work. And I was, I'm a, what is called a physical chemist, not an analytical chemist, and I was doing analytical chemistry at, uh, with this plutonium, and I wanted to do physical chemistry. So uh, the war had ended by this time, and I changed over to another division, the high explosive division. And then I was working on, on this mixture of TNT and some other material, the stuff they used to make these plastic lenses that the, the bomb was made of. And so um, I was working on plut plutonium, high explosive, and off in one corner of the room was this spy. I can't remember his name. There was off in another corner, so uh, I knew that he was. There was a guy I didn't know his name. That's about all. Anyway, so I was working on this, and a few well, by, let's see, it's about ja about December. My draft board let me go, and so I, I thought I would go back to Chicago and go back to school, and so I headed back to Chicago and. My boss was still, my research boss was still at, at was at, still at, at uh, Oak Ridge. So um, I stayed in Chicago, took a couple of courses. In fact, I listened to a course under Fermi, which is, he was a wonderful speaker, although when I went home and tried to, tried to, everything seemed so very clear. When I tried to do it myself, I couldn't figure out. Anyway, after a few, um, after a while, my boss uh, said, why don't you come down to Oak Ridge and, do you, and finish your uh, PhD research there, which I did. And he said he was going to go back to Chicago in a couple, few months. He never did. I never went back to Chicago, although I got my degree from Chicago. So I continued. I was doing, oh, you might say it was basic work, basic science on separation on separation process, on exchange residence. I was working on that. And um, anyway, I got my degree on that, finally got my thesis written. Then I thought, well, there are so many interesting problems for a physical chemist in biology. I'll see if I could get a job in a bi 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 biology division at, um, at Oak Ridge. And I talked to Alexander Hollander, and uh, he gave me a job. He probably regretted it after a while. But anyway, uh, there I first started working on, on DNA. At this point in time, nobody knew what DNA was really for. So I took this, um, was it um, this gland from some thymus gland and made this preparation of, of DNA, sort of a gooey, wax, waxy mess. Didn't really know what it was and radiated. Hollander was very fond of radiating things, see what happened. Anyway, after a while, I got interested in some other uh, form of, 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 of protein action, enzyme action, and uh, with Dave Doherty, uh, 
we've got a little process of, uh, of measuring some of the thermodynamic properties of, of this enzyme uh, substrate, uh, enzyme strub, same thing. I could measure the thermodynamic properties. And I was using the reactor at Oak Ridge. I would get a little reactor sample. I would go to the reactor in the morning with, with this little lead pig and, and um, this little tube, sort of like these um, tubes that used in department stores, they would use to send them in pipes to the cashier. Anyway, you put this little uh, tube in the, in the reactor and come back the next day and carry this back and do your work, uh, make, make this material I needed for, for, um, for, um, for doing this uh, biological work, which incidentally was pretty much what I would have been doing when, when I was working on the separation process on exchange. So anyway, I did this and I was having trouble with, uh, with Hollander, my head of division. He and I didn't agree on many things. So anyway, I was looking, also Europe was in flux and I wanted to see Europe before it maybe exploded. So anyway, my boss, uh, Waldo Coden, had just been to Denmark and talked to this laboratory in, um, in uh, Copenhagen, the Carlsberg Laboratory. And, and he wrote to them, asked if they would be willing to take me, even though I didn't have a fellowship. So, uh, so they said they would, and I went there on my own, of course, for a while. And this was this Carlsberg lab was really quite a wonderful place. The head of it, Carl Linderstrom Lang, what had been in the Danish resistance, was really a marvelous person, an excellent scientist, also an all-around person, cultured, fun, all kind, and it was just a wonderful place to work. There were some famous people there. At one point, I was sitting right across from uh, from um, from what is it? Um, what, what, what was his name? From a Nobel Prize winner, I have to think of his name. Anyway, so it was a wonderful place to work. And also there, there I met my wife. She was a secretary in charge of Americans. She took charge of me. And so we got married in Copenhagen. And then, well, anyway, after a while, I did get a, fel a U.S. A Public Health Service Fellowship, which lasted me for two years. I finished my work, which, um, well, uh, one prominent authority described this work as classic, so I guess it was a f fairly good piece of work. Anyway, came back to the States, was out of a job for a while, and then um, George Boyd, again, my teacher, said, well, could hire me in Oak Ridge, so I came back to Oak Ridge, where I've been ever, well, not ever since. I went back and, again, was working on um, these ion exchange resins using thermodynamics as in thermodynamic and uh, things and um, that and so I did that for a couple of years and then got sort of tired of it and got a crazy idea of looking at some uh, strange ideas I had I don't know if you're familiar with what the Rorschach test is but anyway a psychiatrist or psychologist looks at spots and the patient thinks they're any whatever Whatever he thinks they are, they're anything he thinks of. Well, when a scientist does that, Rorschach, it's a little different. He looks at a lot of spots and he sees things. So he sees a lot of spots and he draws it a line here and a line there. So I sort of thought this looked like that, Rorschach chemistry. And uh, but I continued this. Um, th well, it was, it was uh, 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 calorimetry, it's called. Anyway, um, after a while, there's another thing that sort of crazy idea, ideas by uh, Pauling and Burnell and Iring, two of the leading uh, people at this time, which sort of suggested maybe there was something. So anyway, after a while, I got, sort of thought I wanted, wanted to work on this. And I wrote at the suggestion of people there, I wrote to Pauling, he got a, got a mildly optimistic letter from Pauling, showed it to my boss, and he reluctantly let me do this sort of thing that I want. So anyway, I spent the next time, a couple of years um, doing this. Um, I found something that wasn't quite what I want. It found something and uh, I did first cal what was called calorimetry. No, first I was doing density measurements, what can make extremely accurately. And I thought I saw something there. A little later I did some uh, calorimetry. Again, I saw it. I got my work published, nobody believed it, and nobody has long been forgotten. So anyway, 
Um, that finally, and then there was an, a, um, again, one of these uh, things which happened at the atomic energy. They, they were closing, they were squeezing and firing people. So I got fired, retired, uh, got a job at, um, uh, got a job at Argonne National Laboratory writing environmental impact statements, which I did. It's, I thought, sort of enjoyed Argonne. I hated doing these environmental impact statements, but Argonne was a nice place to, to work. And um, that ended after about six or seven years, and I got a job for a year at Brookhaven uh, doing some work, which I have no idea why they wanted. It was the most stupid thing I've ever done. But anyway, being, living out in Long Island was really quite a fun, although the job was, I have to say was horrible. Living out in Brook, Brookhaven was, living out in Long Island was kind of pleasant. And um, anyway, this ended after about a year and I retired and every year came back to Oak Ridge and where I've been ever since. And that's about it. That's pretty good. It is? Yeah, I don't You're think you bored. took a breath. <laughs> Her life story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes. No, 30 minutes. Okay. That's great. Okay. No, no, you don't need to leave. Don't leave. Okay. No, they really, that's, that's marvelous. Um, I don't think many people could do that. Well, that's since retiring, we've done a lot of traveling. We've been to what about, oh, was it about 50 or 60 different places, including Afghanistan and Mongolia mm -hmm. and just a lot of places, all, all of Western Europe and a lot of places in Asia. We've been in Nepal, we've been in Bhutan, we've been in oh, Japan and China. Just we've done a lot of traveling since retirement. Yeah. And I garden, don't do much of that anymore. Did a little woodwork, don't do much of that anymore. And that's about it, my life. It's good. Okay. now. Why don't you sit back again? Sit back yeah. in your chair. Okay. I mean, yeah. just, just because we're trying to... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. One question I had. How far away do you think you were when you were watching that Trinity test? Well, I just sort of checked on that on Google yesterday, and I think I found the road we came in across the Rio Grande. And as far as I can estimate from this Google map, we were about 20 to 25 miles away. So, well outside the, I guess, safety zone, I'd like 10 miles away. Was yeah, where yeah, yeah. Most yeah, of the observers yeah. were in their concrete yeah, bunker. Yeah. So you were another 10 miles beyond that. And as I say, the sight from 20 miles away was very, very vivid and scary. Yeah. So. You had a good description of that. Yeah. It's a good description, very good. Um, how many of your your colleagues decided to ch switch fields of science away from nuclear physics and, and into some other field? I really can't say. It's pretty much of pretty much of an individual decision. As far as I know, I was the only one who decided to go into biology for whatever reasons. As I said. Um, even even now, there, for a physical chemist, there's so many challenges in biology. If you, well, I haven't seen this for so many years, but the uh, the reports, the meeting reports, there's little abstracts of meeting reports, and the last one I've seen, about half the papers were physical chemistry concerned with biological concerns. So it's, back when I started, there wasn't wasn't much of this, but but now it's very common. But anyway. Uh, anyway, this was sort of a biological thing. I can't think of any, there's any moral, moral inspiration that I wanted to get away, but I think it was more the um, idea of, of seeing these interesting physical chemical problems. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you went from Chicago. Now, in yeah, Chicago, yeah. were you there? Uh, when they built the um, CP1, the Chicago Pile 1? Oh, yeah. Uh, as I was saying, I was doing graduate work and the draft board was getting close and the side of Chicago offered a course, sort of a physical training course 
for free draftees. So part of this physical training course was um, in the West Stands, running over the jumping over seats in the West Stand. And here I was, uh, right below where I was jumping over seats was this first. I didn't know it was there, but all I could, there were these workmen coming out with their faces black with carbon, had no idea what they were doing. I did, uh, did uh, know, of course, they were working on uranium, and, and cause, but I had no idea about, uh, I knew, knew about uh, your, uh, U-235, you could, could form a bomb with U-235, but at this point, uh, I did not know about plutonium, and they were building the reactor. I did not know about what what this reactor was until I got to Ames, Iowa, and there I found out about plutonium and nuclear reactors and the possibility of of energy from nuclear en energy, uh, nuclear energy. So this, so here I was running over and jumping over seats. What right below was the uh, the uh, this first uh, pile? Yeah, first. They said chain reaction, right there. Chain reaction, right below there, yeah. That's fun. Um, so, as a physical chemist, you were not working with a physicist. I mean, you... No, I was doing... Uh, most of the time, a lot of the time, I was doing analytical work. In, in Chicago, this was... Uh, at Chicago, this project was trying to make... You know, to, work in the chemistry, trying to get some of the chemistry of this compound, which was volatile compound uranium. And it was a rather exotic compound, some exotic chemistry. But anyway, this sort of ended up, and then I went to Ames, where, I, again, I was doing, for the first part, doing analytical chemistry on, on pure uranium. Later on, I uh, ended up doing chemistry of, of plutonium, uh, tracer chemistry of plutonium. And why was it so important to understand? Why was it so important to understand the chemistry of these products? Oh, well, when you have a fission reaction, you have a, you have first of all the pluton, you have the um, splitting up, you have fission, and then also you have the, uh, at the same time you have this. Uh, uh, these fission products, you have the new new element, plutonium, then you have these fission products, and you have just a horrible mess of chemistry there, highly radioactive, and getting the, getting the, um, separating the plutonium from this um, horrible mess of radioactive elements is just kind of a very uh, difficult and complex process. There were about the time, uh, just about every group leader in the project at, Ch at Chicago, the Met Lab, was has his own way of getting separating the plutonium. Uh, but eventually, uh, Groves, Groves, who I thoroughly dislike and, and enormously respect for what he did, um, decided that we would use Seaborg, Seaborg's process for separating them. Uh, plutonium from the rest of this mess. So everybody, everybody in the project was working on uh, Seaborgs, and every uh, weekend, week, spending would go to Chicago and attend a meeting, and a little step here, a little step there, and eventually they got a suitable process for uh, using Seaborg's method for, uh, I can't remember the details of it, but using Seaborg's method for extracting plutonium. So anyway, they got this method going, and then this started up at Hanford, got this stuff going at Hanford, and separated out, and sent it down to Los Alamos, and I think I've told you about the bomb. So that was it. Did you know or hear of a Joseph Kennedy who worked with Seaborg? Uh, I think he was head of the chemistry division, which I never met him, but I think he was head of the chemistry. Let's see, who, who, who was the... I can't remember my group leader who was. And there was a Arthur Wall. Art Wall oh, was it Art Wall? I know Joe. Ke I thought chemist Art Wall was there. Yeah, and let's he, see what. I think name. he was the, a group leader. I don't know of which. He was yeah. a group leader, and then the yeah. division was Joe Kennedy. Okay, group yeah. leader. Okay, Joe Kennedy, and um, I, I can't remember the name of this a fellow that I was working for. Um, oh. Anyway, he was head of analytical chemistry there. Mm -hmm. And let's see, what else? 
What else is of interest? Uh, so what was it like? You knew there's a war going on, all your buddies are off in Europe. How did you get deferred? Um, How did you escape going into the army? <laughs> well, when I got onto this project in Chicago, they sent a letter uh, to my draft board that I was necessary for the war work and so that. Then when this war ended, it work ended, and then I got to Los Alamos and I got this one day notice. I gave it to my boss who gave it to the colonel who was in charge. And the colonel sent a letter to my draft board. I may be reached at P.O. Box 1663. You will keep this information confidential. And that was that. So, so anyway, it was, um, they kept sending letters to my draft board that I was essential. I wasn't, of course, but, but um, they had that had that um, idea that kept me out of the dra kept me out of the army. Well, you probably were essential. Not for the work I did. No, <laughs> I was. As you, know, people are fond of talking. There were lots of top scientists at Los Alamos. I was a bottom scientist. But. That's the bottom of the pyramid that holds everything up, right? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a uh, possible spy or someone oh, that you yeah. ran into. Oh, yeah. In this lab, I was working the high explosive laboratory. Oh, I can't remember his name. David yeah. Greenglass? Greenglass, yeah. Greenglass was there, yeah. He was at one end of the lab, I was at the other. And I think we had this high explosive, uh, and somebody in that one end was whacking away with a wooden hammer at a big hunk of this TNT or so on and so forth. So <laughs> it had its moments. Wow. Oh, did you ever feel you were in danger? Not really. The worst experience I had, I suppose, uh, was at Ames. And we were gen we had a fluorine generator, you know, fluorine gas. Uh, and this fluorine gen generator was making hydrogen on one side, uh, fluorine the other. And it was in sort of a heavy metal container. But every once in a while, the fluorine and hydrogen would mix, and there would be a fierce bang. And I guess maybe, um, stuff would spray. So anyway, one time I was working on this thing and this fierce bang occurred. My uh, co-workers there grabbed me and pushed me under this cold, cold, this was a cold day in January, they pushed, pushed me under this ice cold shower and I regard this as the worst experience I had in the war. So which was worse, the posturing or the... <laughs> well, it wasn't, it was... Chlorine? Uh, yeah. Oh, it was... Um, it was probably um, a fluorine on, um, was it, was it the aluminum fluor, whatever the fluoride compound was inside, it may be sprayed a little, but, but there, the, uh, the, the, the container did break, and so maybe tiny amounts of, of, of this stuff may, may or may not have sprayed on me. But anyway, they took no chances and shoved me under this ice cold shower. Um, so were the, was the shower right in the hallway? Where was the shower? Oh, there was a shower right, right above the workspace. It was oh. right there. Mm -hmm. they, they were prepared. Mm -hmm. I think in general, the, the people took, were worried about the health of their people. Uh, they, were, they were constantly checking. Oh, another little incident. When I... Um, when I changed over from working with plutonium to um, high explosive, so they had what is called a piss pass. Uh, you were um, told to stay away from work for um, for a day, and uh, anyway, so I stayed away from the work. I drove around Los Alamos and out in the countryside. And at one point, I was driving through a canyon. There was a herd of cattle, a herd of cattle ahead of me. And there was no way, so and so the cowboys just let me drive behind and herding the cattle. 
until it finally got through. So there I was, a, a cowboy, even a cowboy for a couple of, couple of uh, well, not a half hour or so. And then the cowboy drove, well, rode up to me and gave me a message to carry to the ranch down at the end of the road. So I, was, so I, was, I participated in a roundup. It was kind of exciting. Anyway, got back to Los Alamos and they put me in the hospital, gave me a gallon jug to fill up and fill up overnight. And um, next they tested for plutonium. I guess I had a few counts, nothing much, nothing dramatic or anything. And um, and I, that was it. And I, think I should mention so that uh, plutonium is not is not a terribly dangerous material to work with. It it um, the chemistry is such that it does not absorb readily into the body. So even though it has a horrible reputation. Uh, it's not terribly dangerous to work with, so uh, so uh, anyway, I had a few counts and nothing serious, and very very few, if any, people have ever, ever died of plutonium poisoning. Well, there's some controversy over an experiment. I know the experiment. Tell yeah. us about that. They, Can they, you tell, in, tell they us injected about the these. They injected what they thought were terminal patients and. Um, uh, originally, they thought nothing harmed. And I realized, I know later on they decided there was some controversy, but I'm not at all sure what the, what the controversy was. Um, they, the, original idea, the original thought was that no harm came to these terminal patients, but I don't know if any, any uh, other, uh, that there's more uh, interesting results on that. There's somebody named Cabe, I think Edward Cabe, a truck driver who was, had a broken leg or something from an accident, and he was injected. But I, I thought they were only very terminally ill patients. I didn't, so I, yeah. I don't, well, here's the, here's the, here's the idea. If, if this was done during the wartime, where there were any number of people at risk for plutonium, if it was done to check that, then it perhaps had a more moral, possibly a moral reason for. If it was done after the war when there was no urgent reason, then it was immoral. Just that simple. But as a chemist who studied plutonium, you yeah. would not expect then the plutonium to be ingested or affect the body. How does that work? Um, well, at that time, there wasn't that much uh, plutonium chemistry knowing you didn't really know. And during the war, there would have been urgency to, to find out at the best possible way what these people were exposed to. Were they really exposed to something terrible? Like, say, some, some of the natural things, that, as they know, the natural, some of the natural poisons, are, are all natural poisons, are the most poisonous things known. But anyway, so the question is, is this plutonium so so horribly poisonous, and they wanted to find out. But if it was done after the war, this was utterly immoral. If it was after the urgency, there was no urgency for people working it, and so it was utterly immoral. So, so I, I don't know. I think it was done after the war, which does put it in the utterly immoral uh, category. So that raises another question that everybody gets to answer, which is, how do you feel about um, dropping the atomic bomb in Japan? Well, as I, th I think I, I, I discussed a little earlier, this idea of the horrors, the time of horrors, there was the Japanese, the, the burning of, the fire burning of Tokyo, a horror, the, the Nazi uh, extermination camps, horrors, the Japanese treatment of people in Nanking, horrors, any number of horrors. So here we have another horror. Was this spectacularly worse than any other horror? Then I, I, I don't know, I, I can't make a decision. We, but what I, what I do say is that, okay, we dropped this bomb, we dropped this bomb, two bombs, a couple of days later the horrors ended. And for that I was thankful. So, I know it was a horrible thing to do. It, it was a horrible thing to do, but we don't know. 
Could the war have ended? We don't know. History doesn't tell us what might have happened. So here we have the war ending, the horrors ending, just a couple of days after. And so, as I said, I am thankful for that. Oh, perhaps another thing is Oppenheimer. There have been these statements that Oppenheimer was a spy and Oppenheimer was not a patriot, which infuriates me. When I got there, I was, I was in a way, getting there so late, I was more an observer than a, uh, than a participant. And I could see how these people adored Oppenheimer. He was this fearless leader. He knew everything. He really inspired these people to work. And that would, we'll start with, would all these top scientists have gone there without Oppenheimer? Maybe they would. It, it, the bomb would probably eventually have been made, maybe not, but perhaps much, much later. So maybe that was a good thing. Maybe it would have been a good thing if he hadn't been Oppenheimer, so then we wouldn't have dropped the bomb or something like that. But anyway, it was Oppenheimer who's sort of spiritually as this leader carried this thing through. So, And I heard him talk once or twice, marvelous speaker. So I, I think so anyway. As I say, it infuriates me when people sort of denigrate um, Oppenheimer. I think we talked on the phone about yours. Did you sit in on some of the uh, colloquia? I'm did, sorry? Did you attend any of the colloquia? Oh, yeah. As, okay. a, as a white badge, I could attend on the colloquium. There was one colloquium I remember. Well, I don't really remember. It was on the super gadget. So, uh, I don't know, it could have been Teller who was, was talking, but anyway, somebody was talking about the super gadget, and the ideas they had back during during the war would just not have went, worked. So there's just not, but anyway, it was, as I say, uh, as a, as a um, white badge, I, could have t I was entitled to all the information that was available at Los Alamos. It's kind of a funny thing, though. The GIs who had white badges, the technical scientists, could attend these colloquium. Their superior officers who did not were not supposed to know what was going on. So, did you, in, in going to these colloquia, uh, did you see how um, people from different disciplines would contribute to a problem solving? Or how did that those sessions must have come I up with some I valuable... Can't, I can't really remember yeah. what much of what the subjects were. I know that I went to a couple of colloquiums, including Oppenheimer speaking, and maybe it was Taylor who spoke on the super gadget, but I can't really remember. As I say, it was just... I just got there just weeks before the end of the war, and I was kind of an observer, not a participant, more or less, to say. So uh, I can't really remember much about what the, what they had. Anyway, after the war ended, so they were giving various co courses in physics and so on. So I attended some of the courses. There were, oh, there was um, Beta, I remember Beta, Hans Beta giving a lecture, very wonderful lecture. And, and a few of the others in the Nobel Prize physicist lectures, which I could attend to, of course. I didn't understand too much of it, but anyway, it was just, they were wonderful lectures, just anyhow. Was that part of the Los Alamos University? I don't know. I don't think it was called a university any at that time. I think it was just just various courses and various yeah, subjects, it was, it physics. Was a, I think an informal thing that Oppenheimer started, but obviously it, it didn't last. It lasted about a year, a year and a half, but it gave people a chance to hear these brilliant minds lecture yeah, yeah, before yeah. everybody dissipated. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, soon after the war ended, everybody started back to their universe, as I did too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you like Chicago? I guess you were born there. Yeah, well, I didn't particularly care for it when I was growing up, but later on when we were, I was working at Argonne, and we were living in a suburb about 20 or 30 miles west, so I did kind of get to like Chicago, and I kind of like it now. 
I kind of like Chicago then as kind of an interesting city. In fact, I kind of prefer it to New York, but it was an interesting, easier to get around to, more coast. But I did kind of like Chicago then when I came back after, after the war.